Welcome to CNC Cookbook's Quick Feeds and Speeds course. What we're going to do is walk you through some of the issues surrounding calculating machine tool feeds and speeds and show you how the G-Wizard calculator for machinists can help you solve your problems and get to more optimal feeds and speeds. All machinists know the basics around feeds and speeds. They know how to take your surface speed and calculate spindle RPM and the chip load and number of teeth in the cutter and use that to calculate the feed rate. Some would argue that's good enough, but there's some question about that. In fact, there's a lot of question about that when you really start to dig into what's going on. Really, there are at least four major problems with just using the classic formulas. Problem number one, the tables are just worst case approximations. Problem number two, the simple formulas don't consider chip thinning. Number three, they don't compensate for odd shaped cutters. And number four, they say nothing at all about tool rigidity, which has a lot to do with how things turn out for your cut. So the bottom line is, classic formulas don't consider all the variables. Let's look at each one of these in turn. For example, what's the issue with the tables? In essence, if you're going to boil something down to a table, you can only consider just a very few variables. Uh, you don't get a full range of tool diameter, depth of cut, width of cut, materials, or all the other variables. You're going to get a few examples of tool diameter, a few examples of material, uh, if you're lucky, a couple of different cutting conditions. Maybe they'll give you the uh, chip loads and the surface speed for both slotting and peripheral milling. Uh, if you're really lucky, they'll give you a little bit of data about what to do based on how heavy a cut you're taking. Uh, and a few more materials. But in the end of the day, uh, real life is a continuously varying uh, a set of values for each one of these things that can't really be represented in a simple set of tables. Uh, so in the, in, in the end of the day, what you'd like to see happen is a more sophisticated model that provides interpolation between uh, these fixed values in the tables and the actual conditions you're dealing with. Tables also often don't have much idea about coolant or other conditions you're dealing with. Uh, what goes on when you get below a certain cutter size uh, is quite interesting. The rules start to change when you're micro milling and you know one manufacturer may take you down to an eighth inch cutter, another one down to a sixteenth. Uh, there's a lot of different uh, uh, variability there. Uh, you got to ask yourself when the manufacturer put forward their recommendations. Uh, they're trying to look good to some audience in some way. Are they pushing tool life or material removal rate? And, and what exactly is it that you're interested in optimizing? In the end of the day, what we have to conclude is that these tables are really worst case approximations. Because the manufacturers don't know all the details about what you're really doing with their cutter, uh, they have to assume things are, are, are the worst case. And a, a great example of this is uh, tool paths from high speed machining. So for example, all of your cutter information assumes that you may go through a, a very sharp corner as part of your cut. But if you have a high speed machining tool path that eliminates those corners, you can easily go three to five times faster, which tells you uh, sort of what is the degree of worst case estimate that you're seeing in these tables. Problem number two, chip thinning. Chip thinning is a geometric phenomenon that starts to happen as uh, your depth of cut goes below half the cutter's diameter. If we look at this diagram, you're viewing your cutter from above uh, in the case of radial chip thinning. If you've got a button cutter or a cutter with round inserts or uh, that sort of thing, this is also applicable viewed from uh, uh, the other dimension. Uh, the point is when you're trying to cut in a straight line uh, with a round spinning cutter, 
the chip comes out with an interesting shape and if you're making a very shallow cut if the top of the material was this line here instead of this line here you're getting this this blue chip instead of the red chip and there's quite a difference in the chip thickness the bottom line there is the simple formulas don't account for that difference in chip thickness and so in order to get just to what the manufacturer recommends you're supposed to have for chip load you're gonna have to feed faster and you need to know how much faster you need to go and that's gonna be based on your cutter diameter uh, versus your depth of cut now here's one of the little ironies in uh, machine tool cutting physics babying the cut can actually turn out to be very bad for cutter life. I mean here you are you thought you were going to take it easy on your poor cutter you've gone for a very shallow depth of cut and you've really slowed down your feed rate and it turns out you you almost couldn't look for a worst case thing to do to a tool and the reason is chip thinning. Look at it this way Let's, let's suppose this, this blue shape here is your cutter and you can see that even a very very sharp cutter at some microscopic scale has a radius on the cutting edge. All right? And the important relationship is between uh, the radius of this cutting edge and your chip thickness. If uh, this yellow line here is drawn along the center line of the radius and this shows a cutter that is uh, cutting a chip that is exactly the chip thickness of the cutter's radius. Well, if you're uh, cutting that much or deeper, you're doing great. You're, you're, sheer, you're making a shearing cut in the material and the chip is going to be pushed up and over your cutter. On the other hand, if you're babying the cut with a very shallow depth of cut, and you're running uh, perhaps not even a slower than predicted by the simple formula feed rate but just the feed rate that the simple formulas predict but that feed rate is actually too slow and what's happening is your cutter radius is large in relationship to the chip thickness so if you you know just look at it intuitively uh, it's not going to shear up it's going to try to push that chip underneath the cutter it's going to cause rubbing and you know, and sometimes this even leads to a little better surface finish because it burnishes the the part. But all of that rubbing causes heat, which leads to poor tool life. So you know, the irony is shallow cuts without a chip thinning adjustment lead to rubbing, and that often leads to particularly bad tool life. Something you want to avoid. Problem number three, compensating for odd shaped cutters. Not all cutters are nice and square in profile. Some will have a little radius uh, on the end mill. You may have a face mill that has a lead angle other than 90 degrees. I've got a 45 degree uh, uh, lead angle face mill and it gives a real nice surface finish and a, a little lower uh, cutting forces and it's just generally a really good thing. but you have to compensate for that different lead angle in your feeds and speeds calculation. Uh, a ball nose cutter is probably your best example of this sort of thing. So if I have, let's say, a half inch ball nose, but I'm using it at, at a depth of cut that is less than the radius of the, of the ball nose, well then my effective diameter, since I have a, a circular profile on the cutter, is actually much less than the half inch. Uh, that's going on and of course as you well know that's going to change your feeds and speeds for your cutter. Uh, you're going to want to run it a little bit differently to get optimum results. Last thing I want to talk about is tool deflection. Uh, something that's not even remotely considered by the simple uh, feed and speed formulas. As we know all tools deflect, uh, all metal deflects if you apply force to it. It's just a question of how much and uh, as it turns out when you're roughing you would like to try to keep your tool deflection to a thousandth of an inch or less uh, because what happens is as you start to get to a thousandth of an inch and greater you're starting to create conditions that are going to want to induce chatter right I mean think about a vibrating tuning fork if you deflect one of the tines on the fork and release it uh, you know that's going to set it into vibration 
and so you're you're likely going to start causing chatter the further away you move from a thousandth of an inch now by the way having the tool deflect a thousandth of an inch isn't the world's greatest thing for your accuracy uh, of your machining operation either but you know in this case you're roughing so maybe you can tolerate that for finishing you want a much lower tool deflection allowance uh, two tenths of an inch or less uh, in order to achieve some degree of accuracy and finish on your part uh, are really what you're looking for and uh, many machinists are surprised when they start looking at the uh, uh, impact of tool deflection how little it really takes uh, for you to be off a little bit from where you ought to be and get a lot more tool deflection than what you expect. Uh, the mathematics around tool deflection are such that uh, you're talking about cubing or sometimes taking uh, a dimension to the fourth power uh, which really creates an exponential impact uh, on on what's going on there so you know what we're talking about doing here by looking at tool deflection is looking at the impact of the horsepower that the spindle is injecting uh, uh, on the tooling and you know by the way you also ought to be considering the impact of that horsepower that force uh, if you convert the horsepower to a force uh, on your machine and on your setup so you know, being aware of and being in charge of what's going on with that uh, is very important uh, when you're figuring out what your feeds and speeds ought to be and as I say it's not really covered by the simple formulas so what we're finding is optimizing feeds and speeds is all about being able to master more variables the problem with that is I mean, you know we got the two mad scientists doing their math on the chalkboard is it's a lot of work to do that by hand there's a lot of math involved in it long worksheets I know machinists that have uh, really long Excel spreadsheets to figure all this stuff out uh, some of the tooling manufacturers have uh, multiple calculators you'd have to go through to figure out all these different uh, parameters and in general it's just it's a real pain to do this by hand uh, so the answer is use a calculator and that's what G-Wizard is all about so let's do a quick demo and see how these different factors are handled by G-Wizard